this computer. Okay. We're recording. Uh, hey guys. So welcome both y'all um, for coming to speak today. Um, I'm going to introduce who our speakers are for photojournalism class. And I'm also going to get an intro on the project that they did. Um, and we're also just going to talk about uh, community involvement in photography projects and how that's important to photojournalism. So from 2003 to 2005, there was a photography project uh, that the Appalachian Program at Southeast K Kentucky Community and Technical College in Cumberland did in conjunction with students and residents of Harlan County. The University of North Carolina's professor in photography, Jeff Whetstone at the time, was a consult consultant for this project and ultimately the Rockefeller grant um, that the program was awarded. This involved engagement with the community in multiple forms of public art initiatives from other visiting artists as well. So our first speaker is gonna be Robert Geip. Um, he is an author of three novels, one that's coming out this year. Um, these novels are creative fiction uh, about living in rural central Appalachia. He is the former director of the Appalachian program at the Southeast Kentucky Community and Technical College, as well as a producer emeritus and current advisor of Higher Ground in Harlan, uh, which is a performance and theatrical community-based theater organization. He has directed um, the Southeast Kentucky Re Revitalization Project, which trains workers in fields related to creative placemaking. Uh, he's coordinated the Great Mountain Mural Mega Fest, co-produced the Hurricane Gap Community Theater Institute, and advises on It's Good to Be Young in the Mountains, a youth-driven conference. Robert formerly worked at Apple Shop and Art Center in Whitesburg, Kentucky. He resides in Harlan, between Harlan and Lexington, and he grew up in Kingsport, Tennessee, Tri-City native. <laughs> um, our other speaker is uh, Rebecca O'Daughtry. Uh, Rebecca is joining us because she was a student and assistant of Professor Jeff Whetstone when he was working on this photography project in Harlan. She will give her account on working with folks in the community during that period. She is also the former Appalachian Media Institute director in Whitesburg, Kentucky. She is currently a co-producer and educational ed and education campaign director for a feature length documentary film on rising hate and white supremacy in America, focusing on the Squirrel Hill Synagogue attacks in Pittsburgh that happened in 2008, 18, sorry. <laughs> Previously, Rebecca was a mentor for the Stay Project, uh, the first ne network for young leaders in Appalachia to collaborate collaboratively address issues of racism, poverty, and human rights. She was also an educational partner with, higher, the, with the Highlander Research and Educational Center uh, just above Knoxville, Tennessee. So welcome to both and yeah, uh, excited to have the discussion that we're gonna have. So um, I guess my first question is gonna be um, what, is uh, the project that you worked on? Um, what were your all's roles? Um, and maybe speak to it further about uh, the implications of modern photojournalism in a collaborative manner instead of a hierarchy ratio between uh, photographer and subject. So y'all have the floor. Um, you wanna go first, Becky, or? Um, do you want to maybe do an overview of the project? Sure. Okay. And so, then... um, uh, 2001, um, I was teaching Appalachian Studies at a community college, Harlan County, Kentucky, and um, we were made aware of a grant that the John D. Rockefeller Foundation was putting out, um, and the grant program was called Partnerships Affirming Community Transformation. And um, we were supposed to take a, some, a challenge the community was facing and talk about um, how we'd use art to respond to it. And so we did a community-based process and the challenge we decided to confront through the arts was uh, the um, 
opioid epidemic, the OxyContin crisis in particular. And, um, and we wrote a proposal on that. And of course, this was in 2001. Um, we didn't have any kind of uh, very evolved, very formal response to that crisis at that time. Um, and so we talked to people, um, probably several hundred people, our students talked to about what um, art forms to use to respond. And so we came up with three that we thought would be accessible to people, photography, and then uh, we did some public art with Tom Mosaic and we did a theater project. And all these were kind of grounded in my background in documentary work uh, while I was at Apple Shop, but also um, getting non-professional artists doing artwork on behalf of uh, community needs. And so I had worked with Jeff Whetstone. He, uh, his uh, girlfriend and now wife had come to Whitesburg, the Apple Shop, to work on a, a documentary about her grandmother, who was a um, hairstylist who helped people get their black lung checks, uh, black lung benefits. And she made a film called Irene, and Jeff tagged along with her. Uh, I mean, I, I think he would say that too. You know, he came and he started doing freelance work for the Mountain Eagle, which was the uh, newspaper in Letcher County. And then um, he eventually went back to grad school and got his degree and started teaching at uh, UNC. And so one of the, so we wanted to work with him just cause he's a good friend and good fun. And so uh, together as a part of this proposal that we wrote to Rockefeller, um, his students will come and work with my students to do a visual census of the community. And so um, this was before everybody had a cell phone with a camera on it. And so we distributed 600 single use, uh, cameras, disposable cameras, um, in the community. I think in the end we had about two or 300 community photographers and they created, you know, tens of thousands of images. We had to, uh, a lot of logistics around uh, getting the film to the drugstore. I think we actually ended up using um, a printer, a lab in Bristol. Uh, I forget what the name of it was. We worked with Malcolm Wilson. He was uh, uh, another professional photographer, an artist who was a part of the project. And um, I think y'all came twice, didn't you, Rebecca? To or. Go. Well, I'll let Rebecca pick it up. So, what what was your yeah. perspective on it? Um. So the the year the project started, Robert, with the photos. What year was that? Do you remember? Two thousand three. Two thousand three. Okay. So um, that was I was like nineteen or twenty. That was my sophomore year in college, um, and I think we. We, we were there three, at least three um, spring breaks. So those three years. And then also um, kind of the people involved in the project on the Harlan side who were the most interested, they started coming to Chapel Hill with you because we had the photo um, printing facilities there. Um, so th there was a back and, f back and forth. Um, at least five or six times um, by the time we, we started putting the exhibit up in 2005 or 2006. Um, so that's a lot of really boring numbers. <laughs> um, I'll, I'll, I'll get to the storytelling part of it. Um, uh, Jeff Whetstone was an incredible professor to have in college. Um, and he also was teaching, co-teaching alongside Wendy Ewald, who has a long history of um, centering young people as professional art makers. Um, and I recommend watching Portraits and Dreams that's streaming now uh, for free on PBS, I believe. 
Um, and then there's also some conversations that have been recorded around that documentary, specifically with Wendy and Jeff Whetstone, um, which is interesting. Um, so what we were doing, what Jeff specializes in is large format photography. So that is, um, for anyone who's not familiar, that's a... Um, like an eight by 10 negative, the size of a piece of paper, and you put a giant cape over your head and you depress the shutter and hold still without breathing for 60 seconds underneath the cape. And then this was at the end of a uh, Polaroid film being made. So this is something Robert and I were talking earlier about was this was the end of the film era um, before we moved into this era where is everyone a photojournalist? Does everyone have a camera? What, what role do people who are photographers professionally play versus citizens as a whole? Um, so this was the end of being able to get your hands on a special kind of Polaroid film that produced, if you carried buckets of chemicals around with you, um, produced a negative and it produced a positive Polaroid image. Uh, that was a about a four by five, I think, or two by three, maybe. And so we would be out in the community with community college students of all ages and high school students. Um, and our role was specifically in taking this fine art approach as a collective or a collaborative. Um, so we weren't working as much with people with the single use cameras. We were doing this very slow way of deciding what image you were gonna make. Um, and then you take a single frame. I mean, now people might take a hundred shots in 30 seconds, like just trying to get someone to blow out the candles on their birthday cake. So this was a very different way of reflection on what's in front of you. Um, and the thing I was thinking about was um, I don't know if this is a discussion your students have had in their other classes or your class, but yeah. I personally think citizen journalism is very important. And I've also spent my career thinking about what role does art and representation play in the kind of justice and equity we have in our communities and the quality of democracy we have access to. Um, and journalism as a whole across all the arts and representation plays a huge role in that. And do you want just a, the elite to have access and the ability to take unpaid internships telling that story? Or do you want everyone to have the ability to tell that story? Um, and so that's a whole other discussion about citizen journalism. But I think what we were doing here was citizen photojournalism also with a, a fine arts reflection. But when you take a collaborative approach to understanding problems, I think that also means you're taking, a, you're recognizing the systemicness of certain problems. So you're saying poverty is an isn't an individual issue that grows out of a system. The opioid crisis isn't an individual issue or failure or shame that grows out of a system. Um, and the act of taking this collaborative public approach takes you out of the isolation. Um, and I remember being back, um, I'm, I'm gonna wrap up and pass this back to Robert in a second. Um, but I remember being in um, Eastern Kentucky between, you know, 2002 and 2006 and the severity of the opioid crisis and also the ways we weren't talking about it and the ways we were talking about it. And I remember Robert sharing at a community meeting, him and Tony Sweat about the pathology of addiction, that it's not the person who's suffering who addiction who suffers, it's the entire family system, it's the entire social fabric. And so this was a project that elevated from an individual experience to a collective cry because we involved everyone. 
Um, I'll say this. I, I was in South Africa uh, one of the summers um, around this time working with street photographers, which is a different issue of representation we can come back to. But a lot of what we were trying to do was photograph what was good in these in Cape Town despite the AIDS crisis. And that did not feel different from what we were doing on Harlan County, trying to capture what people cared about in spite of the opioid crisis. Really, you want to ask something? To yeah. Figure out how to go forward. So, I guess how did the community members in Harlan react to? this project did they and how did they did they like taking pictures having ownership of the images that they were taking um i guess what did they feel like when they were exhibited um and how is that different than uh i guess other forms that we've seen of how photography has been shown um either in magazines or in museums <clears throat> I guess what did it do for the community at large? How did how did people feel about the project? Um, so first thing I would say is that um, to get those 600 cameras out, just thinking back, we had friends who were uh, elementary school based teachers and teachers in high school. Um, we work with the, the GED classes at the high school, at the college. Uh, we had a couple of churches that participated, in particular one African-American church, I remember. Um, we worked with the Boys and Girls Club in the community. And I think for us, uh, you know, one of the realities we were looking at in 2003, 2004 is that um, you know, this drug crisis had hit. And uh, in the beginning of that, uh, it, was, it was not clear that this was um, something other than just the personal failings of the people who were getting addicted to Oxycontin. You know, the, it was just kind of coming into focus that, uh, that, that Purdue Pharma was systematically pushing a drug that they knew to be highly addictive uh -huh. as non-addictive and was making the whole medical community complicit in their uh, um, drug peddling. And so people were still kind of coming to terms with, with this as a, a, a something that, that was bigger than any individual and was more insidious than just the failure of, of any family to protect itself from drug abuse. Uh -huh. And so, you know, I think that just kind of at uh, ground zero of that, just as people living in the community, that we kind of, a, we didn't really even ever talk about that with the people that were getting these cameras. We, we were just giving people cameras and, what I remember the most is encouraging people to take pictures together. Um, and I think that, you know, that um, especially with the kids, that was, that I think that really was a great reflection in the work that they were, you know, we encouraged them to go out in groups and make portraits of each other. And um, I remember in particular one group of boys at Wallens Elementary who just, went out four wheeling and, and just did their, I remember one of them telling me that he had really good pictures, but the four wheeler ran over his camera. And so he didn't, oh, he didn't have them, but, uh, and there's one particularly, one of my favorite images is one of those boys holding up a dead skunk <laughs> uh, that they, I don't know how it came to be dead. Um, but anyway, so, you know, so uh, in large part, they weren't really taking pictures in the service of any um, uh, cause other than the joy of taking pictures. I think, you know, and then the other thing was that um, we made kind of a point to send just students who were 
you know, by and large art majors or whatever they were, but were being very intentional and taking their spring breaks. And so this was, you know, and pairing them with community photographers so that everyone was kind of leveled every, I mean, it's so funny. It seems so uh, obvious now, but at that time, you know, that some people had cameras and some people didn't. And this project was kind of putting a camera in everybody's hands. Yeah. Um, I think also we were kind of stressing the idea, and this was across this project, that we wanted we wanted the community to work with visiting artists, and, and we did in all these different media we worked in. But the idea was teaching, the being real deliberate about reminding both the artists and the community members about the reciprocity of the, you know, that everybody had something to offer, that everybody was better at something than the other person when it came to making art about a place like Harlan. I seems like I remember Rebecca when there's some story about you there was a slide down the mountain where you got it, you didn't snow and Donna Joe take you out into the I also remember a picture of Rebecca being led across a railroad bridge. Yeah. Uh and she was <laughs> that was uh, in efforts. Uh, yeah. <laughs> you know, and so there was a fair amount of just documenting each other. I think, and the other thing I remember is that um, one of the ways I sold it to the community is you could get these big fancy photographers and make a picture of your family. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that, that yeah, we, that yeah. If you would participate, like I know Tony Sweat that uh, there's a real beautiful portrait that Jeff made of um, uh, Tony's family cool. that he did with a four by five camera, I guess. And so, you know, it was kind of, I mean, that for me, then that really grew out of my experience at Apple Shop where, you know, you were daily kind of talking about and working out of the perspective of who's holding the camera and what difference does that make? Yeah. And so, you know, my practice in terms of setting it up and distributing the cameras and, you know, the kind of, um, the way we were talking to the visiting artists about the community and the community about the visiting artists was really informed by that, that this was something uh, we were gonna do together. And really how that circled back around to the crisis is that, um, you know, that it was kind of speaking to the idea that we shouldn't go it alone in terms of responding to addiction in our house. We should look at this as a community, uh, challenge and and actually when we the other thing i should say is that most of the photographers were writing you know like the kids and then like the gd students everybody was creating an essay or you know doing an interview and so there was this mass of uh language that went with the images and a lot of that ended up in a, a musical we did called higher ground and um, you know, the, the kind of organizing metaphor of it was that uh, the flood of prescription drugs in the community was analogous to when the rivers would flood and people would get washed out of their houses and that uh, uh, nobody would try to un work through that alone necessarily, that, you know, that that required a community response. And, and so in the same way that um, you know, a community being washed away in a flood would require community-wide response. So would the, a flood of um, prescription drugs. And all of that was kind of uh, reinforced by our process in doing this community photography exhibit. Yeah. So something Robert said about um, the act of making the photographs together also reinforced this message that, you know, no one in the community created this problem, you know, that, but also that you don't have to go it alone. Um, the thing that I think a lot of us intellectually know is that uh, you're supposed to respect everyone's humanity and everyone's here for a reason. 
but what does that mean in practice? And are you practicing those values and how you do your work and what kind of art or journalism you make and share? Um, the act of making those photos for me, I think really reinforced that no one's expendable. Mm. You know, I, I think what I uh, unfortunately saw with our, our federal early federal and state responses and the pharma and medical community responses to this opioid epidemic was it felt like they were treating people uh, as expendable sure. and um, that there wasn't as much value to maybe a rural person's life who was addicted to someone, you know, who was, you know, had a middle-class life in a city who wasn't addicted or it just, the act of looking at the places you love and the people you care about and replicating that image and sharing that, I think that's very, it's both empowering and bolstering and it gives you the strength to protect yourself and your community. Um, and I think we've seen, you know, we've seen that before when people talk about oral histories from the AIDS crisis in America, it's the sense that we were okay with throwing an entire generation of gay men away. And uh, that response was incredibly slow. Um, and I was sharing a little earlier, that, you know, I think this work that I did with Robert and Jeff, you know, went on to influence me for the rest of my life until now. But when I was in South Africa working with street photographers, they, they're the people who take pictures of weddings and new babies. And just like there wasn't a camera in every person's hand, you know, in America, in these low resource communities, there wasn't uh, in the townships, there wasn't, which were, you know, recovering from apartheid, there wasn't a camera in every person's hands there. So and the, the picture of the townships, the representation in the mass media is so counter to the images that these street photographers make that are of celebration and vibrancy and so much incredible style. And so there's a whole alternative history to what was happening in those townships and who those people were versus what was being shown at the height of the AIDS crisis and uh, the height of apartheid and post-apartheid in South Africa. It's, um, you make the images about what you care about and what you value and you show people there's value, not just a social problem or a social need or a lacking. Yeah, that kind of goes into this idea of kind of decolonizing the lens, right? So, community members all over the world kind of taking ownership in their image and in some ways I feel like everybody becoming a photographer is sometimes a good thing because we all have the ability to be our own like public relations manager that we can all like democratically show ourselves the way that we want to show the way that we want to curate how we look and it's not someone else taking uh the image from someone else some somewhere else that doesn't know you know anything about us um but yeah i don't i, don't, mm, I think i think that's interesting i think an, another question for maybe both of you in this idea of kind of collaborative art making is why is photography still not seen as a collaborative form of art i feel like we have we're, we're still talking about these projects as if they're new and innovative and uh you know this tour de force but they've been going on for a long time um and it's yeah, so I guess I guess my question is why so we have all these other art forms, video, theater, uh, sculpture, et cetera, that are all considered public co collaborative forms, but photography is still kind of not in that category uh, or just openly accepted as a collaborative form. So uh, what do you all think about that? 
I, I I don't know. I mean, I think the thing is, uh, photography's always had a little. Well, since the uh, invention of the brownie camera, or whatever, for, photography's had an issue of even being seen as something that can be an art form. Because I think of you know, from the first time somebody said say cheese, uh, photography's always been a collaborative. <laughs> you know, there's always been a, a collaboration between the subject and the creator, as far as that goes. That you know, that was very interactive. Um, that way and I think the you know the other thing I wanted to the other thing that I remember from that project that speaks to the some of the themes that we're talking about is so uh, so I took it was uh Snow and Lisa Frith and Tony Sweat uh I think Russell Bergen went one time John Mark Wiggins uh, Ashley's sister, Sarah, she's Sarah Goforth at that time. But anyway, a, a cross section of, um, uh, just citizens, you know, not necessarily people, everybody, you know, they all had an aesthetic sense and were good storytellers and good photographers, but they went with me to Chapel Hill to, we went to Chapel Hill to, um, uh, lay out all these photographs and we, you know, we, I mean, I should say we mounted several thousand images on foam core and just stacked them on the walls in the halls of the Appalachian Center. And then, um, and then we decided to work with uh, Rebecca's peers and Jeff to create more of a traveling exhibit, a, a highly curated uh, 75 image um, exhibit that was that they printed and so you know and um, framed got framed anyway and um, and so we took a group of Harlan Countyans to Chapel Hill to kind of I mean it's extremely daunting right you had several hundred photographers uh, 20 people or 15 people looking at all these pictures and one of the things I want to, and I'm sure Becky remembers this, there were just thousands of little three by five pictures laid out on tables. And we put little dot stickers on which ones we liked and, uh, um, you know, and then kind of cut it down to 8,000 and then down to 500. And uh, so the thing I remember about that was that you know, those of us who'd had an art history class or whatever, we're making, uh, we were making different selections than what people, you know, it really reminded me the, the function of photography, right? That, that I just want a picture of my dad. I don't care how good it is. You know, it's like, I would rather have a good or a, a picture of my dad than a picture that made really good use of circles or whatever. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> you know, that these were, these were competing impulses. And I think, you know, and, but, but the other thing about photography is, is that there are people who've never had a lesson, but have great eyes. Yeah. And, um, but I think the other thing was, boy, when it really, where the rubber really hit the road was that, when you'd have two pictures of the same subject and there'd be a difference that seemed to be grounded in, in uh, something that had to do with aesthetics and, and the history of photography and what, you know, what, it's like, I can remember, I just remember it's like, why are you, why did, why, Robert, why did they choose that when the head was cut off? You know what I mean? That people yeah. would find images interesting in part because they were off centered or, or, you know, the head was cut off or whatever that, uh, and that was, do you remember any of that Re Rebecca, you know, that, yeah. that the whole curating is a whole other thing. I, I, when you were sharing earlier, just about, um, you know, like, were we going in with this 
overarching art directive of why we were taught giving people cameras what it reminded me of is that a lot of the art making came in the collaborative curation and that that was really important and um that it also makes you question well like like you're saying is it this picture of your dad or took a lot of uh cockfighting pictures i remember that i remember <laughs> being with um donna and snow and a bunch of chickens and um it was so i think those are very important questions so for the art students who were my peers and myself i think i learned a lot about how to look outside of a pretty narrow box of artistic value mm -hmm. and listen to other people um i also remember it got a little harder as the years went on in terms of working with not the Southeast Community College and the higher ground people on things, but there was a core group of my peers who were very, that were not coming into the process with artistic ego. And then, you know, young, some younger people, you know, who were, you know, uh, freshmen or sophomores at the time as we were progressing through would come on these trips and I think they were looking for what they were going to get out of it in that moment or telling their story or I don't know but I just remember feeling uncomfortable and a little exasperated with their listening skills um, it, it felt disrespectful um, and that, you know, that's not the story of the project at all. Uh, it, it just, the, how you were listening to people and respecting their point of view, I, I thought was one of the most important parts of the artistic collaboration. Well, I think that, you know, that one of the things, the, one of the learnings there is just that as any one individual is not representative of a community. Any one student from UNC was not representative of the group. And I think that was that was one thing that we learned working at the scale we did, you know, that we had whole classes of students and whole whole hundreds of, of participants is that and and we're working over years, you know, that uh that the burden of representation shifted, you know, that this image is not uh, gonna be the only image of Appalachia or this, you know, this one photography student is not gonna become emblematic of all photography students. And that's not inconsequential, you know, it's like, uh, um, I think the other thing that that's kind of related to that, that, and I can't, quite put my finger on what exactly we did to make it this way um is that we got into that space where you know people were working together to get cool images you know it's like you're just trying to do something cool and uh i think that we were able to create an environment around the harlan countyans that you know we got past who was representing what, and you just were working together to kind of come up with something that was, you know, and I think that it's, it's, in, uh, I would pass this along and as not as a uh, casting aspersions on anyone that we were also working with a lot, with a, a set of social work students at the same time. And it was interesting to me, and again, uh, not to overgeneralize, but that a lot of times the photography students, I thought uh, were better able to put into action a uh, responsible, a social conscience in a responsible way that the social work students struggled with because they had come to do social work <laughs> and not just be with people. Well, and, like uh, social work 
at people. Like you can't social work at someone and then have them want to hang out with you. And I think, right. um, like, I mean, you could say so as, about photography too. You can't just, well, and, yeah. Okay. And that's <laughs> what I want to talk to it. Speak to is, um, no, I want to talk to that concept. I yeah. want to speak to like, as a recovered fine art photographer is how I would consider myself. <laughs> sure. um, I'd say I got out of making art on my own because it, it was spending too much time in my own head. That sure. wasn't fun for me. It, it's, it works better for some other people. and um, Or some other people can balance that in the collaborative work. But what I found, I think, from doing this project and other work is I only wanted to do collaborative public artwork. Yeah. Um, but as, so as the reformed fine art photographer, it's, it's hard to find the right subject matter to work with. It's hard to find the right thing to even photograph. Um, I was at the Whitney Biennial last year, um, right, right before um, we stopped having a public life because of COVID. <laughs> like, yeah. I think that was, I remember the last three museums I was at before everything shut down and the biennial was fine. It got mixed reviews last year. Um, I thought the photography there was particularly unstrong. And here's an example. They were, there was a series of photographs of, of women given, giving birth. And I don't know, can't remember if it's the photographer's name or my my camera just fell. Um, I can't I can't remember the photographer's name, but it was you could tell something was off in why they were photographing that subject and their relationship with the women. Like you just got a weird feeling, right? Yeah. And going into this collaborative photography, if if you know what's good for you as a photographer, you're like, oh, cool. If I listen to these other people and pay attention to their point of view and what they're saying, I'm going to eventually have an insight into something versus these people are living lives that don't look like mine. And I need to capture as much of their souls as possible mm -hmm. for my fame and fortune. Right. And I know that sounds hyperbolic, but I, I, I do see people taking pictures like that all the time still. Um, and so to me, to have that experience was a huge gift where people wanted to collaborate with me and work with me and, and just explore things and be really creative. And I, I think the photography students who were the most successful in this project were the ones who were just like, I don't know a thing, question mark, question mark, question mark, let me see what happens versus here's how you take photos or here's what's going to be the most controversial image or, you know, the issue with some of the social work students, which is like, I have a pre-existing framework for how change happens and how understanding happens and how I help someone and let me apply that framework to you. But if you're being truly collaborative, you come up with the questions together. You come up with the framework together. You come up with the methodology together um, or you just experiment and see what happens. And just because something isn't formally produced from an art school or a journalism school, you're not looking for pedigree or status and what or how people are creating. You're looking for what they're saying. So I think if you're really listening to people, you're really respecting them, that, that's what comes out of it. Yeah. If you're listening to yourself, you're not a good collaborator. Right. Hmm. Hey, Sorry. Pig I'd say piggybacking on that. You know, I, th I think that uh, one of the things I've gotten more interested in as the years go by is this, you know, America, had, part of its mythos is this idea of the, of the great individual. You know, this is very patriarchal and Western Civ, you know, that they're, all these heroic individuals who do things. And I think that, you know, as we go along, most of the thing, 
one, most of the, the thing you realize is that that that's a myth, you know, that, mm -hmm. that the best work comes out of community, um, whether that's a group of artists who happen to be in one place at one time or people who, you know, whose art grows out of um, being a part of something larger than themselves that I mean, it's not that not that people aren't individually talented, but that resonance, I think, in the work itself grows out of um, people's process. And maybe somebody that wouldn't like it as much as I do, uh, if it, you know, that, it's a whole other aesthetic debate, right? It's like some people don't like stuff that's that's made with a bunch of other people. But I, I think for me, you know that. It's, I, I'm kind of ripping off of what uh, Becky said about he, there was something in the work that suggested that the relationship wasn't there with the people who were part of the work, in this case, the subjects, uh, and that you pick up on that. It breaks up the... Man, I, I'm just interested that... that, uh, uh, that um, that I mean, I, I want to ask you to talk more about why you feel uh, photography hasn't been as collaborative. That because that I would, I mean, if you'd asked me, you know, about collaborative art forms, I would have, I would have probably put photography at the top, really. I think it is collaborative in a sense but it's more of a hierarchy between photographer and subject and less, what I'm asking more is like, you, there's not a lot of projects where there's ownership with an entire community or a group of people and that they're sharing equal ownership in what's being made, uh, how it's being curated and shown um, that I, I just feel like that kind of collaboration doesn't come out of it. Yeah, yes, there's a, if you're a photographer and you have, you're conscious about your, what you're photographing, then you're going to go into these situations with that in mind, but it's still a one-to-one -one ratio of you're taking and then distributing and someone's making an institution of some sort is making money off of that image or you're making money off of that image or you're getting fame for that image etc it's not the there's less dynamic of who's being in, uh, involved and I, that's kind of i think the crux of just documentary photography in general um, i think it depends where you're you're I what um, the venues you're experiencing artwork in too, sure. because yeah. like, so I came up with uh, Robert as my mentor, Jeff Whetstone as my professor, Wendy Ewald as my long-term professor and ev every single piece of work I've done um, has been couched in some type of collaborative art making it's not always photography um mm -hmm. where, where unc was big on they have the southern oral history project there so then it's also a question of i mean oral history depending on who's editing it and how can can also be one uh, very collaborative or not collaborative at all even if you're telling someone else's story sure. it depends how yeah. you curate it um so, so I think it's the execution of the project. And then it's a question of, okay, so is it what's being shown in the community? Is it what's being shown in museums? Um, is, um, I just want to tie in a, a much earlier point back to, um, you know, we were talking about what's changed and how we collaborate now that everyone has cameras. Mm -hmm. um, and also I think our current, human rights crisis about how we treat black people in this country is having the movement and attention it deserves and needs now because everyone has a camera. Mm -hmm. So, you know, is that, you know, is that, um, it's obviously not 
uh, I'm sure someone is making very interesting artwork of those devastating recordings, but at, at some level, that's photojournalism and citizen journalism, Definitely. having that just someone else's eyes and perspective. Um, but, but in terms of the collaborative nature crossing over into a more commercialized arena on the journalism side or the fine arts arena, I, I really recommend looking at Wendy Ewald's museum exhibits because that crosses over, that puts collaborative art making in a fine arts venue. Sure. Uh, what she did with uh, Denise Dixon, I guess, and the Detroit, is it the Detroit Contemporary? Or uh, she's probably shown it yeah. lots of different places, multiple, yeah. and and her world projects too. I'm sure she showed it yeah. too. Um, I think I I had the opposite growing up. So yeah. you all you all had this very collaborative. Uh, nature with photography I was taught that photography is this one-to-one -one ratio and that I it, it was not until grad school for me that someone said you're benefiting from that person and I had to do this like double take of like what does that even mean so I've been questioning that in my work for for years now um and even um I'm thinking about curation now. I was just asked by a magazine to take some photos of some folks in Harlan. And I was, I thought I took some nice dignified images and they picked these ones that are kind of wrapped around still the stereotyping of, of people here. So it's like, well, I did my best to try and represent these people underneath these circumstances, but I'm still from an art direction of someone else saying that, no, we don't want these images. We want these other ones that you took. Well, and even if you didn't even take any of those images that meet the pre-existing stereotype that is basically clickbait now that's going to increase the number of people who look at an article and either pity or get outraged or upset. Mm -hmm. They do whatever they want in, you know, uh, Adobe to make it look however they want anyway. Right. I was um, listening to a podcast yesterday specifically about the magazine covers that came out the week after OJ Simpson's Bronco chase right. and how everyone had the exact same photographs because all they had was his mugshot. Mm -hmm. And so every publication in America was scrambling to do something different. And um, I can't remember who it was, if it was Newsweek or Time. Time darkened Dark it. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah, so they were talking about those decisions and it it is it's it's about who's who's in the gatekeepers deciding what we look at and how we look at people and so um part of the collaborative process is saying maybe you should decide how you want to be looked at instead of you know someone else um and um, to, to that end, then there's, um, you know, Elizabeth Barrett's documentary, which I also recommend watching, which is Stranger with a Camera, um, oh, yeah. which does the one, an excellent job, starting with the Lyndon Johnson's War in Poverty, talking about images and who's making them and who's allowed to make them. But that's, I mean, that's a huge issue. I, I see, um, being debated among journalists is uh, who, who gets to be editors in these newsrooms, whose p personal opinions are censored, who's then who otherwise is forgiven for, you know, teaching with racist slurs, um, that it's if you don't have the appropriate representation, um, in your newsrooms at all levels from the top to the bottom, then of course you're going to get news that's alienating to the most vulnerable populations. 
because you can sell the most by sensationalizing. And um, part of that issue is figuring out how to democratize access to those newsrooms and the decision makers because most people access them through unpaid internships and you only get unpaid internships if your family has enough money to support an adult yeah not being paid exactly yeah that's fascinating shoot we got (laughs) that was a lot to unpack um I'm trying to think on how we can wrap this up. Um, I guess going back to the, the Higher Ground Project, uh, Rebecca, you said that that kind of informed everything that you've done, I guess, artistically. Um, and I guess the same thing goes with Robert. I guess maybe how did the, that, just maybe reiterating, how did that impact how you started working or, or kept working with communities and how um, that, and maybe also like maybe some advice on like for budding journalists and, and people that are dealing with visual uh, representation. Uh, what maybe, what is some uh, advice that you'd give them on how to be as collaborative as possible? So. Well, I would say um, you'll probably share this with your class, but the, the history of the Higher Ground Project with examples of the art and the photographs is online. And mm-hmm. I, I would read that. Um, and I would, I, I, if, if you're serious about it, I really would watch those documentaries I mentioned. They're um, incredibly powerful. Um, and I have um, a friend of ours, um, uh, organizer at Highlander tried to gather the most um, the best case examples of collaborative art making in service of social change sure. um, and I think she explained how those projects happened and talked to all the people were involved so like that's a great way to see different ways to apply this beyond um, just you know the higher ground project so I, I, I think I mean, in the case of anything, it's seeking out the materials and immersing yourself in past examples um, and then looking for pre-existing projects in your community who you could add value to. Right. So you, you have a special skill set, whether it's a journalist or a communications major or a photographer. So who's doing work that if you wanted to share that skill set with them, you could help support their work. Awesome. Thanks. Robert, do you have anything? Yeah, I, I mean, I think it starts with um, what you as a, a photographer, photojournalist, or whatever value. And if you value that idea of uh, working with people um, then you're, you're going to be looking for ways to, to live that value at every phase of the project. I think for this particular project, it kind of became clear as we talked about it that, um, I mean, when the images were being generated, it was important. I was thinking about your, um, I was thinking about what happened with you in the magazine, a couple a couple of things occurred to me that, you know, that I, I put in my head for the next time I'm in that situation. One is that, you know, you don't send it to them if you don't want them to, you know what I mean? That you have, you have an editorial. I mean, and the other thing that I learned that the hard, I mean, well, here's the, the situation, of course, you know, I learned that with author photos. It's like, I don't put it on my website unless I want to see it again on a flyer for some you know it's like if you don't want it shown don't put it out there but they put shitty photos of you up anyway they're because they're everywhere now right it's like you don't have very much control but the other thing is that like with the advent of digital photography uh you know you can say 
you can go back over your pictures with the person while you're there a little bit anyway and at least leave with a sense of having shared with that person that you think their opinion is important i mean i think that at the end of the day was the thing with our curation of the higher ground exhibit you know that 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 was part of the legacy of the project is that we spent money to take people to the spot where it was getting curated and they had input on it and even not, if well ahead. not just curated but printed so they yeah. saw the amount of care and time that was being applied to reproducing their images in in this really large scale and the amount of time you spent saying okay do you want to make this darker do you want to make this bigger are we going to crop this so it was not just you know, being there to select it, it was seeing with the respect that those images were being treated with, it was the same respect that we were treating our own artwork. Yeah. And the other thing yeah. I was thinking in terms of, a, you know, if I, it's like, if you're a photographer, photojournalism, NIST journalist, it's like, if you were a moving company or you were moving people's furniture, you could be the kind that uh, somebody, you just get paid to do it and you go and take the furniture from here to there. You could be a U-Haul kind of person where you work with people to get the stuff out of the house or you could be a thief and just steal the furniture. <laughs> yeah. I wasn't expecting that, okay. <laughs> and then whichever way you choose, you get the furniture out of the house. Wow. But how does the people whose house that is feel about you after they see their furniture in the resale shop? Yeah. Oh, I like and that. That's a photographer. Yeah, I thought you would. I was. <laughs> yeah. But anyway, so I, I think that, you know, that, that, uh, I mean, it really, I mean, I think the thing for all of us, really, I mean, we, were very influenced by that apple shop um meditation on what is our what is the relationship of the subject to the to the creator and how do you break it down how do you change it and um you know and i think that rebecca and me and jeff and wendy and all the rest have you know solved that answer that question in different ways but you have to ask it so many people don't even you know they're so bound up in the world of who's paying for it and who's who's uh who's awarding me who's giving me awards that they forget that it's a lot i mean what i would say it's just a lot more fun to do it this way mm -hmm. it's so much more fun yeah and you get better treats too i mean john mark made us that deer jerky <laughs> and, and i'm a vegetarian i still appreciated it yeah. uh you get better snacks um you you just you, you get better stories that's for sure yeah. we can get into that yeah. you you learn more about the world I, I can share a little bit about this i i didn't make this connection till till robert was speaking but so I'm working on a documentary now about the synagogue attacks in Squirrel Hill in Pittsburgh which was the largest um, anti-semitic murder in the history of the United States and a lot of people wanted to make a documentary about that and I am working with one of the most community-based Documentary, documentarian directors you can find. She's incredible. Her previous film was about untested rape kits. So she was able to talk to women who were mistreated by the police, who's, who had been so mistreated in trying to prosecute their rapes that they didn't feel safe talking to anyone. And she was able to work alongside them and got herself trained in trauma sensitive conversation to make sure that while she was interviewing these women, she didn't add or contribute to their trauma. And we bought, brought that perspective into this film that we're working on. 
Now, a lot of, so we've gained the trust of the families um, of the people who were murdered and the survivors who escaped the temple that day. But we don't want to tell this sensational story about hate motivated murder. We want to tell the story that the people who survived and the families of the victims, we want to tell the story they want to tell. And so we're going back to them with every single cut of the film. We're making decisions with them. Um, and this is not the type of film you would make about such a serious uh, piece of violence in America usually. If you look at the documentaries that are having the most commercial success in the last five years, it's about sensationalizing the victimization and sexual violence against women. <laughs> I mean, it's like documentary SVU instead of law and order SVU. Mm -hmm. And we could have gone that route and sold the film a lot quicker and had a lot more money to make it with. Um, but at the end of the day, we would have known that we wouldn't have made anything better for the people who would live through this. Um, and I'm sure we're not doing it perfectly. Um, but what I was saying to Robert earlier on the phone is I've been trying to think, okay, how do I do an education campaign about this? And all I've come back to is maybe we need to publicly make these photographs together about living through hate and living with it and, and why. And maybe that's a way to have a conversation that we haven't really been able to have in the U.S. successfully yet. Yeah. So it is those choices about your subjects at every turn. Yeah, I think that boils down to minimizing harm. And the, uh, that's kind of like a, a photojournalist's motto is to always minimize, it's, it's like harm reduction. Mm -hmm. and, um, I think adding that uh, collaborative component and seeking for the ideal mm -hmm. best, but you're not always going to hit that ideal. And right. It's okay. Um, you can get close. I mean, people are going to be picky about how they're being represented and it's fine. Um, but just, I think even just, I think the thing is just having that in your head as a journalist is going to make you, like you said, get better treats. <laughs> <laughs> so. um, I, I, I was really moved and, and, and it actually circles back to the kind of way we approach this project I just saw a list uh, um, films about black life that don't center on black trauma hmm. to show yeah. African American you know I think a lot of white people think we're doing uh, people a favor by um, focusing so much on trauma of other people that this shows our sympathy, which has its place. But you know, just for as we as we get more involved in actually what it means to um, contribute to a better world for everyone, that that was important to me. And I think it does speak to what we were trying to do with this project. We were responding to a trauma, an ongoing trauma, but you you do it by celebrating life as much as uh, that is equally important as expressing your outrage. And um, they're not I mean, it's, exclusive, but. It's very reductionist and dehumanizing to, to, to just make someone into their pain point. Yeah. That's the most, um, you, it, I don't have a better word to say it than, and clickbait and 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 I think that's I mean there are better words to say it I just don't possess them Robert probably does because he's a writer but it's it's um it just feels to me like what do you want the first 10 seconds of attention or do you want a paradigm shifting conversation and um I think Robert's right. It does real harm 
to just look at people in this reductionist way to only talk to them or look at them when you want to examine their trauma for your really own escapist entertainment. Um, Or to assuage your your guilt, mm -hmm. your hand in this trauma. But if Mm -hmm. you live through it, you're like, you don't need to tell me about that just because you just discovered it. Mm hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know how much. I mean, I could bring up the so the magazine I just work with. The images I sent them back to Robert's point is something that, yes, I wanted to be published, but it was also going back to how uh, Rebecca was talking about the OJ images and how one that one made him darker made him more which made him more menacing which made that kind of into an issue about race um and how we view race in america at that point and this magazine has said we want these images but we want them all black and white and we want them darker want more contrast so it's like this well okay the just because it's setting more of a, it's another tone and the article is another kind of like one of those focusing on poverty and Appalachia. And that's again, that kind of pain point um, in the area. And that's all we are monolithically, right. Is this one thing. So it's taking what I have and making it darker again to, again, only focus on kind of this, this pain that they want to showcase in this article. So I don't know. I don't know where else to go off of that other than it's interesting experiencing it um, instead of just theorizing on it. I'll, I'll say something about audience perception too. I, I um, love my mother dearly. Um, <laughs> <laughs> let's preface this with that. Um, she, you know, she worked in low, high need, low income inner city schools her whole life, beloved by her students, uh, mostly worked with special needs kids. Uh So it's not, and I was working in Appalachia with student populations who were facing similar problems, but, you know, from very different backgrounds. And I showed her a video my students made, um, and it was literally the whole video was about a young woman learning how to play banjo from her grandfather and loving it. It was just like, you know, a 15 minute short. And what I got out of the short is this is really what I love about being around my grandfather. Right. Great. I show it to my mother. We talk about it. I'm, I'm home in New York and I hear her describing it on the phone to someone else 10 minutes later. And she's going, well, it was such a nice video. It was about how everyone's so poor, but they're so happy. And I was like, that is not what it was about. (laughs) (laughs) But would she have come to that just from watching that 15 minute video? Or was it the first 50 years of her life getting those images of Appalachia that set her up to say that, you know, like, um, and I, you know, like, uh, <laughs> so we had a whole conversation about it. And, you know, she, she, the one thing I love about my mother is she, at almost 70 years old, is always willing to learn and change her mind about things. But gosh, that, that's what happens when you show people images that uh, aren't truly representative for years and years and years. Right. no matter what you show them next they have a whole history of visual images behind them yeah i i i've always said to my students how would if new york city was only painted as one thing how would we view it you know appalachia has been point of this monolithic view but new york is the has had the advantage of having a lot of media and a lot of uh, equity and a lot of money pushed so that we see it as this multicultural thing and um lots of people different people live there lots of different ideas lots of different and it's this 
whole thing. And what would happen if Appalachia had that? How would we view view it as less as a monolithic thing and more of this multicultural thing that it really is? So it's yeah, it's interesting. Who's the gatekeeper and who's who's perpetuating Im these images and who's and who's profiting off of them? Right. So I think Sarah Jones, who's at um, New York Magazine now and writes other places nationally, I think Atlantic. Um, she's from East Tennessee. Okay. She, she does an incredible job of trying to fix all of Appalachian representation all by herself. <laughs> but, she, you know, she's a young person who's writing these articles. And I, I just think her perspective is really interesting and watching her try and shift an entire national conversation every time she writes is really interesting. That's cool. That's cool. Well, do we have any uh, final thoughts on everything? <laughs> no, that's a lot. <laughs> this is gonna be a lot for students to unpack, but I think it's good for them to think about this. I, I gave my little cool wrap up metaphor and y'all just, you know, kept going so you, you can say gonna, it again I, i'm not gonna wrap it up again i think <laughs> I, I think the point is it's unwrappable yeah that's, that's why i'll just gonna let, it, <laughs> let it go that's everyone right. should ask their own questions and come to their own conclusions yeah i love that well thank you both um i'm gonna stop recording and then we can uh chit chat a little bit more before we all get off so Thank you. Uh, I wish that we had an audience for applause, but um, yeah. Thanks again. Thank you. Hi. How do I stop recording?